Hello and welcome. Thank you for taking time to watch this video about the agreement and principle reached between Canada and the United States to modernize the Columbia River Treaty. My name is Brooke McMurchie and I am part of the Columbia River Treaty team with the province of British Columbia. Before we get going, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the territories of the Indigenous nations that extend across the Canadian Columbia River Basin. On July 11th, 2024, the Government of Canada and the United States announced that they had reached an Agreement in Principle, or an AIP, on the key elements of a modernized treaty. This is an important milestone in the process towards modernizing the treaty. Throughout this video, you'll hear from members of the Canadian Negotiation Delegation as they describe what the countries have agreed to in principle under the themes of flood risk management, Canadian flexibility, hydropower and transmission, compensation, and ecosystem health and Indigenous values. This video is meant to be an overview of the agreement and principal elements. There are more opportunities to learn about the AIP in greater detail and to provide feedback. Those opportunities will be shared at the end of this video, along with next steps in the treaty modernization process. Let's get started. We'll now hear from Canada's lead negotiator, Stephen Gluck. Good day, everyone. My name is Stephen Gluck, and I am the lead negotiator for the Columbia River Treaty at Global Affairs Canada. I am pleased to have this opportunity to reach out to all of you in the Columbia River Basin and to extend my acknowledgement to the Tanaka, Shkwetmik, and Silks Okanagan nations who have contributed so much to the process and whose territories are found in the basin. I will lead off this video by providing some information on how we got to the agreement in principle, also referred to as the AIP, that was reached with the United States in early July to modernize the Columbia River Treaty. I will then turn it over to BC and the Tanaha, Shkwetmik, and Silks Okanagan colleagues to provide you with greater detail on the AIP. The AIP was reached after six years of discussions with the US. The agreement in principle is a non legally binding document that provides the Canadian and US negotiation teams a clear roadmap to move forward and begin drafting a renewed treaty. It also means that we will continue our engagement to seek your feedback and explain the next steps. More details about how to participate will be shared at the end of this video. The Columbia River Treaty is a significant agreement on both sides of the border. It provides clean energy to millions of households, businesses, and industries in both Canada and the United States. It plays a crucial role in reducing flood damage thanks to the three dams on the Canadian side that operate for flood risk management. As you are all keenly aware, the treaty came into force in 1964 and three dams were built in Canada, Duncan, Keenleyside, and Micah. The U.S. constructed the Libby Dam, resulting in the transboundary Kukanusa Reservoir. As part of the treaty, BC received a payment for providing assured flood control to the U.S. for 60 years and one half of the potential incremental electricity generated in the U.S., known as the Canadian Entitlement. But this has come at a significant cost to Canadians living in the basin from a social, environmental, and economic standpoint. Negative impacts from the construction of the water reservoirs include permanent flooding, massive fluctuations in water levels, and ecological damage, including to Indigenous lands. And First Nations and local communities were not consulted when the dams were built. The renegotiation of the CRT is also important because the needs and interests of the basin have changed since the treaty entered into force in the 1960s in terms of increased electricity demand and growing environmental awareness, as well as Canada's commitment to advancing reconciliation with Indigenous peoples through a renewed nation-to-nation -nation relationship based on recognition of rights, respect, and partnership. The modernization of CRT is an opportunity to make improvements and to do things differently. Now I'll quickly highlight the negotiation process. Following reviews in both countries, the negotiations to modernize the CRT began in 2018. The Canadian delegation is made up of federal, provincial, and Indigenous nations representatives. Since 2018, when negotiations began, representatives of the three Indigenous nations have been working closely with the governments of Canada and BC, and since 2019, have been full participants in the negotiating team, helping to develop and refine Canadian negotiating positions. This team has been coordinated and strong 
It is also a positive example of working together for the people living in the basin. Given the complexity of the issues and bringing voice to the range of interests, it took some time, but we were able after 19 rounds of negotiations and numerous other exchanges to reach an agreement in principle with the US. For the Canadian side, successful renegotiation means gaining increased flexibility in the operation of the three Canadian dams for domestic priorities, such as for ecosystem improvements and supporting indigenous cultural values and community interests. We are also creating a transboundary body that will make recommendations on ecosystem benefits, integrating indigenous cultural values, adaptive management, and working together to study salmon reintroduction. The AIP also includes a new pre-planned flood risk management regime for the U.S. that would replace the current assured regime that expires in September 2024. It also includes a similar hydropower operation. And while the AIP would see the CRT remain as an ongoing agreement that can be terminated by either Canada or the U.S. with 10 years notice, the new pre-planned flood risk management and new hydropower regimes are for 20 years. The AIP includes updated compensation for Canada for providing these services. This and other elements of the AIP will be further explained by my colleagues during the rest of this video. While both countries have made compromises, we believe the AIP addresses many of the basin's interests and it supports a renewed approach to sharing benefits between countries and a renewed nation-to-nation -nation approach with Indigenous peoples. I will now turn to my BC colleague, Kathy Eichenberger, to expand on the importance and benefits for BC. Hello, my name is Kathy Eichenberger. I'm the executive director of the CRT team and the lead negotiator for the province of BC. Before we get into the content of the agreement in principle, I'd like to say a few words on how we got here. The BC government has been engaging with Indigenous nations, local governments, and residents of the basin since 2012 to learn what their priorities are and what they want to see changed in a modernized treaty. During that time, we've connected with people through over 50 in-person and virtual meetings. We've also used social media, newsletters, emails, letters, and even one-on-one -on -one phone calls to connect directly with the citizens. Members of the Canadian negotiating delegation, including Canada's chief negotiator and representatives from the province and the Basin Indigenous Nations have attended public meetings to share our insights into the negotiations and the process for modernizing the CRT. We've answered questions and heard from residents firsthand. And as this engagement progresses, we'll continue to do just that. We've also connected regularly with two very important committees. First, the Columbia River Treaty Local Governance Committee, and then the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee. These two groups include members from across the BC Columbia Basin, who've been providing advice and recommendations on what a modernized treaty should look like. The contents of this AIP reflect that input, and we expect you'll find that the AIP represents Basin interests in many ways that the original treaty did not. I'll now take time to explain the key changes that are under the agreement in principle and how they're different from what's in the current treaty. One of the significant changes that we'll see under a modernized treaty is in the amount of flood risk management services that Canada provides to the United States. Under the current treaty, Canada provides the US with 8.95 million acre feet of pre-planned assured flood risk management storage in the Canadian Treaty Reservoirs. A million acre feet is just what it sounds like. One acre by one foot deep times a million. So that means that we store that amount of space available at the three reservoirs, Duncan, Arrow, and Kinbasket to lessen the risk of flood damage south of the border, as well as downstream of Canadian communities like Castle Gar and Trail. In the AIP, Canada will provide 3.6 million acre feet. So that's a 60% reduction from the current level. The US will pay BC for this FRM service, an annual amount of $37.6 million US indexed to inflation. 
The 3.6 MAF of flood storage will be in the Arrow Lakes Reservoir, which is the most effective storage for mitigating flood risk in the US. The reduction of the overall flood storage space lessens restrictions on how treaty reservoirs may be operated. And as a consequence, US will need to operate their reservoirs more conservatively than they do today. The US will still be able to call on Canada for additional storage space in the event of an extreme flood risk for a fee. This called upon flood risk management exists in the current treaty, although it has never been used. And it requires the US to make effective use of all of the flood risk management space in its own reservoirs before calling on Canada. The details of when such call could occur and the corresponding payment are still being discussed. I will now talk about the Canadian flexibility. A significant negotiated improvement to the current treaty is the achievement of greater flexibility to meet our own domestic objectives. The treaty requires Canada and the US to annually coordinate 15.5 million acre feet of reservoir storage space behind the Canadian treaty dams to optimize hydropower generation primarily in the US, but also in Canada and Mica Dam, for example. Throughout the negotiating process, we've talked about wanting more flexibility on how BC operates its dams, and that's exactly what we've achieved. The AIP outlines that under a modernized treaty, Canada can unilaterally decide to reduce the coordinated storage to a minimum of 11.5 million acre feet in each year for the first 15 years, and then further reduction to 10.5 million acre feet for the following five years, which is almost a third of the total treaty storage. That means that BC will have up to four to five million acre feet to manage every year to support basin interests without needing agreement from the US. This range of flexibility will be used to address impacts resulting from the treaty to ecosystems, to indigenous cultural values, and to socioeconomic interests in the basin. This approach reflects what we've heard from BC Columbia Basin residents, local governments, and indigenous nations over more than a decade of engagement with the BC provincial government. How we intend to use this flexibility will be grounded on the significant research and river management scenario modeling that's currently underway. Part of this work involves looking at changes in reservoir levels and flows from the dams throughout the year. This ongoing work, which began several years ago to determine objectives and operational scenarios for the system modeling, is being led by the Tanaha, the Shekwepam, and the Silk Okanagan Nations in collaboration with federal and provincial governments, the Columbia River Treaty Local Government Committee, and environmental, non-governmental organizations, scientists, and technical consultants. The Local Governments Committee is promoting socioeconomic objectives such as recreation, transportation, and flood mitigation, amongst other interests, in the modeling work. What the AIP represents is a significant step forward, having greater flexibility to address domestic reservoir and river management once the modernized treaty is in place. Once options for changes in reservoir and flow management using the new flexibility have been developed, we will hold a separate public engagement process with basin communities to show how the use of the new flexibility will lead to improvements and we will seek their feedback. Now I'll speak to the power coordination and transmission. As you may have heard, the agreement in principle includes a reduction of the Canadian entitlement. The entitlement is half of the additional hydropower potential that could be produced in the US as a result of how BC operates its treaty dams. The U.S. sends this power to Canada in the form of electricity, which is sold at market value to either BC Hydro or utilities in the United States. The revenue from the Canadian entitlement goes to the province and helps support programs and services delivered across BC. A portion of the Canadian entitlement is also shared with the Canadian Columbia Indigenous Nations. Since the beginning, the entitlement was always projected to decline over time during the life of the treaty, and we've planned for that reduction. While the agreement principle reduces the amount of power delivered to BC by the US in the shorter term, there is more certainty to BC in the longer term, and that is over the next 20 years. 
the Canadian entitlement energy decreases by 33% in year one of the agreement in principle and drops to 50% by year 20. But we retain sufficient capacity to maximize the value of that energy when selling it on the market. In addition, for every million acre feet that is used for domestic flexibility, the Canadian entitlement will further be reduced by 6.5% as there is no corresponding power benefit to the US. In addition to the long-term bookable income from the Canadian entitlement to BC general revenue, there are other power-related benefits that were negotiated. The AIP provides two opportunities to expand BC's ability to import and export electricity from and to the United States. Canada has secured 1,120 megawatts of rights to U.S. transmission service flowing south in the U.S., north to the BC-U.S. border, primarily along the I-5 corridor. Under the Modernized Treaty, this transmission capacity will be made available to PowerX, the trading arm of BC Hydro, for imports of the Canadian entitlement and for other U.S. energy supply. This will give BC the ability to import clean electricity from the US when it's economic to do so, so that BC Hydro can conserve water in its reservoirs for power generation during high demand periods, such as cold winters. This will support BC's domestic hydro system reliability and energy security. And there will be also new transmission opportunities. Bonneville Power Administration, the U.S. federal equivalent of BC Hydro in the Pacific Northwest, will conduct a study on significantly expanding transmission between BC and the U.S. on the eastern side of the province near Nelway, which is east of Trail down to Spokane, Washington. Depending on what that study determines, Bonneville may expand its transmission facilities to enable increased clean energy trade between Canada and the U.S. This would provide economic, reliability and environmental benefits on both sides of the border, including the support for continued additional renewable generation in both countries. Now I will talk about the additional compensation that we've negotiated in the treaty. In addition to the Canadian entitlement and the annual pre-planned flood risk management payments of 37.6 million US, additional compensation was negotiated for Canada. We have many times spoken over the years about the many additional benefits that the U.S. receives from operations of the Canadian Treaty Reservoirs. Benefits to irrigation, to recreation, to navigation, and fisheries. The current treaty doesn't provide any compensation to Canada for these U.S. benefits. The U.S. now recognizes these additional benefits and the AIP provides for an additional 16.6 .6 million US to Canada annually once the modernized treaty is in place. Again, these payments will be indexed to inflation through 2044. It bears reminding that due to the 1963 Canada-BC agreement, any benefits from the CRT flow to the province of BC. We'll now move the presentation to the Indigenous Nations representatives will speak on the new environmental sections of the agreement in principle. Why Haskell Health, Chaisin Squeeze. Um, my name is Jay Johnson. I am the lead negotiator on behalf of the Seattle Coconaga Nation, uh, working on the Columbia River Treaty negotiations. The Tanaha, Shwetmik, and Seal Coconaga Nations have been working in close partnership over the past six years, and our relationships with Canada and British Columbia have helped shape priorities, objectives, negotiating positions for the AIP. Kiso Kukit, Hugakla Jamie Viano, Hunini Tanaka. Hello, I'm Jamie Viano. I represent the Tanaka Nation on the Canadian delegation for the treaty negotiations. It was important for our nations to participate in the AIP negotiations to bring to the negotiating table our cultural values, which includes our responsibility for the river and all living things. Our nations take a one river approach that reflects the sacred duty to improve intrinsic ecosystem health for all living things from the Columbia River's headwaters to the estuary at the Pacific Ocean. Wait, Ethan Matthew and Squest. I am a representative of the Sahuab Nation to the Canadian delegation in the, in the treaty negotiations. <laughs> 
The agreement in principle, which is the framework for the amended treaty, has new ecological provisions that can be seen as the third leg of the stool of the treaty, in addition to flood risk management and hydropower. White Husko Hall, TP Snoxill, and Chai Suis, Isquaco Tipalat, East Sestasta. Hello, my name is Rosalie Yazi, and I'm a member of the Silk Okanagan Nation. I also serve as legal counsel to the Chief's Executive Council, as well as a representative of the Silk Okanagan Nation on the Columbia River Treaty Negotiations Advisory Team. If implemented in a way that ensures our First Nations have a role in decision making, the new provisions will support Indigenous cultural values and ecosystem health, as well as the restoration and strengthening of salmon populations. The ecological provisions of the treaty are based on adaptive management so that changes can be made in the future to continue to support the health of the river and species like salmon that rely on the river. What are some of these new provisions in the AIP? Flexibility, new Indigenous-led ecosystem and cultural values body, salmon reintroduction, and the Kootenai Transboundary Working Group. Wipe this wide up. Meeple Mark Thomas runs Squints. Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Thomas. I'm a leader for Shuswap Band and a representative on the Columbia River Treaty for the Columbia Nation. There is new flexibility in the agreement in principle, also known as the AIP, demonstrating inclusivity of other important values to the basin. BC and BC Hydro will be able for the first time to use up to 5 million acre feet of water for domestic ecosystem and cultural value purposes. The water can help rejuvenate wetlands, increase flows when needed for salmon, and other fish, which will create the ecosystem needed to bring our salmon home to the Upper Columbia. It can also help address Indigenous, regional, cultural, and other recreational needs. Having flexibility to use water to support the ecosystem and cultural values will become even more important in the future as we increasingly suffer the consequences of climate change. Importantly, there will be a new body led by the Indigenous nations and U.S. tribes, which will undertake research and make recommendations on how treaty and other hydro system operations can better support ecosystem need and Indigenous and tribal cultural values. This body will support a one river approach and integrates an adaptive management framework. All modern transboundary river treaties have a governance body, but what makes the ecological and cultural plans in the AIP unique is that they will be Indigenous led and rely on the guidance of elders and knowledge keepers. This approach will help center Indigenous and tribal cultural values along with Western science to support the eco ecosystem health of the Columbia River system. For the first time in the Columbia, there will be coordination on salmon reintroduction studies and strategies from Indigenous nations and tribes on each side of the border. In addition, the AIP guarantees that Canada will provide at least 1 million acre feet of water to support salmon survival and migration. My name is Troy Hunter, and I'm the team lead negotiator for the Columbia River Treaty in the Tanaka Nation. Salmon have been blocked from returning to the Canadian portion of the Upper Columbia River for more than 80 years. The long-term vision is to return salmon stocks for Indigenous food, social and ceremonial needs, and to benefit the region's residents and ecosystems as a whole. Working with the U.S. tribes will hopefully move us closer to welcoming the salmon back to their ancestral home. The Silk Okanagan Nation has already done so much work to bring the salmon back to the Okanagan through the lower reaches of the Columbia River. The efforts are paying off with record numbers of sockeye salmon returning to the Okanagan this year. We know that salmon will come back to the Upper Columbia if we make the conditions right for them. That's why having measures in a new CRT that support salmon is so important to Indigenous nations and to all British Columbians. Supporting salmon means ensuring there is enough water in the system for their migration both as juveniles and adults, good spawning areas, and passage through the dams. There are measures in the AIP to help support those requirements. If the new CRT is ratified, it is going to be essential that those new measures are implemented in a timely and good way in partnership with Indigenous nations. Salmon is a keystone species in the Columbia River system, 
If salmon can return and thrive in the upper reaches of the Columbia, the entire ecosystem will benefit. Salmon in the system means a healthier ecosystem. Helping the existing Okanagan Columbia River salmon stocks in BC and bringing salmon back to the upper Columbia River basin will also support and sustain our cultural values. Salmon are central to each of our nations culturally, spiritually, economically, and relationship-wise. The agreement in principle also includes a new body, the Kootenai Transboundary Working Group. This committee will inform the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that own and operate the Libby Dam. The Tanaka Nation will have representatives from both sides of the border participating in the committee as the Tanaka Nation have communities within the Kootenai River watershed that also feeds into the Columbia system. The Tanaka people have in particular suffered from the flooding caused by the Libby Dam under the Columbia River Treaty. And this new body is a step forward in giving us a voice in how that dam is managed. Three Indigenous nations are looking to a modernized treaty that respects our rights as we pursue standing up ecosystem and Indigenous cultural values. For the Indigenous nations to have a meaningful voice in the process, benefit sharing, redress, and river health. All of our nations, as governments, will need to have a voice in how the modernized Columbia River Treaty operates in the future, and we'll need to see some benefits from it. We have much more work to do. Gone are the days when Crown governments can make unilateral decisions that impact First Nations and expect the First Nations to bear the consequences. As the final modernized Columbia River Treaty language is drafted, Canada and BC have committed to seeking our three nations free, prior, and informed consent. The commitment to the successful negotiation of these issues, as well as the incorporation of ecosystem health and Indigenous cultural values into the modernized treaty are necessary conditions for the provision of Indigenous nations' consent. We look forward to continuing our important work with Canada and British Columbia, as well as the United States and the U.S. tribes, to conclude a modernized treaty that improves the health of our one river, the Columbia. After six years of negotiations, we now have an agreement in principle on the key elements of a modernized treaty that better supports people and ecosystems in the basin. But there are other processes that need to take place on both sides of the border. These include drafting the text of the amended treaty, which will be informed by the engagement process that is currently underway. When the treaty text is drafted, it will then need to be approved by the BC government and ratified by the US and Canadian federal governments. I can assure you that BC is intimately involved in the drafting of the treaty text. This is not just the two federal governments deciding on the path forward. There will also be, as mentioned, future public consultation on Canadian flexibility options. It's important to be clear that there is no set date for when a modernized Columbia River Treaty will come into effect. Both countries have committed to getting it in place as soon as possible, but our first priority is engagement. Thank you to all the speakers for these presentations and for their hard work throughout negotiations with the United States. If you are interested in learning more about the agreement in principle, there are a number of opportunities to do so. Informational materials and answers to frequently asked questions are available on the BC Columbia River Treaty website. More detail about the AIP will be shared on that website soon. In September of this year, the BC Columbia River Treaty team will host a virtual public information session for people to learn more, ask questions, and share their feedback. A recording of the session will be available afterwards for those who are unable to attend or want to watch it again. We also plan to hold a series of in-person community meetings in the Canadian portion of the Columbia Basin, which we expect will begin later in the year. Stay up to date on these activities by visiting the BC Columbia River Treaty website, following us on Facebook and X, formerly Twitter, and subscribing to email updates. Links for all these options will be shared at the end of this video and are available in the description. Questions, comments, and feedback are welcome anytime by emailing Treaty at gov.bc.ca.
We are at an exciting moment in the process of modernizing the Columbia River Treaty. At the same time, as you heard, there's lots of work to be done before a modernized treaty is finalized. I encourage everyone to take part by learning about the agreement in principle and what it means for the Columbia Basin. Thank you again for tuning in.